Good evening, everyone. I'm Sarah Coffin, Head of the Product Design and Decorative Arts Department here and co-curator with Stephen Harrison of the uh, Jazz Age uh, American Style in the 1920s. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you here this evening. Um, I and Stephen and Emily Orr, the Assistant Curator of Modern and Contemporary American Design, who all work together on the exhibition, uh, will uh, look forward to presenting a few of our finds from the uh, exhibition for you this evening. Uh, we will do it in the order that Stephen uh, will be first, and so I am going to introduce him first and then just uh, tell you a little bit more about um, the evening. Just as a reminder, we are being uh, having this streamed online and obviously also available on cooperhewitt.org later. So please remember to turn off your cell phones uh, and otherwise um, I and also wait for the mic when we get to the Q&A because we need to be able to have the uh, recording um, have the question as well as the answer. Stephen and I have had the pleasure of working together for some time, not only on this exhibition, but also in terms of loans back and forth, and particularly to Stephen's award-winning exhibition, Artistic Luxury, Fabergé Tiffany Lalique, which uh, happened in 2009. Uh, after I did a Rococo exhibition uh, to which he lent Cleveland's extraordinary uh, Meissonier Turin, which was really the star of this uh, major exhibition that we did here. So uh, that was a great pleasure. And then we pooled our resources when we realized we both had, had different reasons for investigating the 1920s. Uh, Stephen having moved forward a uh, couple of decades from the, his previous work, and I was reviewing the collection here at Cooper Hewitt uh, for uh, what we had that was extraordinary and that seemed to have little been seen. And it's ended up that the exhibition here features 165 objects out of the 395 that are in the exhibition from our permanent collection, which shows you uh, that we had good reason to be interested in doing an exhibition on the 1920s. Um, so this exhibition was really uh, an effort to look at the broad range of styles that uh, happened with to um, in America for American taste from abroad, the influences, and uh, the result is being, uh, we hope, to show the diversity of stylistic interests uh, in the era. Uh, Stephen has also done work uh, he, and been curator. He is now uh, head of the decorative art and design department at Cleveland, uh, but and previously he was at the High Museum in Atlanta, where he re oversaw the complete reinstallation of the High's collection of American and European decorative arts uh, while simultaneously expanding its 20th century holdings. So uh, he has also held curatorial positions in New Orleans and uh, Dallas. I also want to give a shout out to Emily, who has extraordinarily, with all the work that we have been doing on Jazz Age, including her authorship of some parts of the book, uh, managed to finish her thesis and get her PhD last year. Her thesis is entitled appropriately and connectedly to the exhibition, but not related in its inception, Designing Display in the Department Store, Techniques, Technologies, and Professionalization, 1880 to 1920. So that will uh, give you a bit of background on why we're here, and I will now turn over the, uh, uh, turn over the floor and the podium to Stephen. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank all of you for coming this evening. Um, I want to just reiterate what a, a, a wonderful, fun process this has been, and part of what has made it so much fun is been working with Sarah and Emily on this uh, wonderful project and this uh, deep dive, if you will, back into the uh, one of the most dynamic eras in American history, the 1920s. Although I have to say, uh, the recent this current decade is turning out to be a very dynamic one as well. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, uh, what emerged after uh, the 19 uh, after the First World War, I should say. 
um, in terms of architecture and design, was still probably a very conservative landscape, even though trends in um, um, reform uh, in design that had begun uh, with the Art Nouveau and the secessionist movements in Europe uh, prior to the First World War, uh, even though they were uh, well uh, established in Europe uh, prior to the First World War, that material really hadn't seen uh, a dissemination uh, to America uh, until the 1920s, really. Uh, so uh, artists and, and Americans, uh, designers, uh, going to Europe in the 1920s would have seen um, a, a, a European uh, design aesthetic that really had its roots prior to the First World War and then brought it back for um, reinterpretation and um, uh, a, a, a revival, if you will, in the 1920s in America. So what I was quite interested in, in Cleveland, Ohio, we have many, many buildings built in the 1920s, but um, they don't look anything like Corbusier or uh, Picasso might have had a, a hand in it at all. In fact, they look much more like a uh, Tudor city, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, buildings that, for all intents and purposes, were modern in terms of their uh, systems and, and uh, their, their new building uh, materials, etc., but clad on the outside with a veneer of traditionalism, either Renaissance revival, neoclassicism, or indeed a, a great Tudor uh, revival. Uh, so all up and down Shaker Boulevard, you'll see mansions, but they will, uh, they're almost all of them, uh, very much in the sort of storybook Tudor uh, architectural style that developed uh, in the 1920s. This traditionalism went along with um, the, the rise in uh, moral uh, uh, leanings in terms of, of uh, the city being uh, something to be feared uh, and the, the virtues of the countryside, as well as um, those uh, the, the steady drumbeat of, of prohibition, uh, which of course uh, uh, took hold um, in, uh, in 1919, 1920, with the enactment of the, uh, of the, I believe it's the 18th Amendment to the Constitution. Um, so in, 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 in New York, uh, as in other great cities around the country, uh, developments happened concurrently. Uh, both those that were in modernist styles, but also in very much in traditional historical styles. In Cleveland, indeed, our Tudor city, if you will, was a large complex of apartment houses that were, uh, in fact, contiguous, uh, called Moreland Courts. They all tend to have very lofty-sounding, traditional, often English uh, names. Uh, and inside of them, they um, include wonderful uh, woodworking, uh, woodwork, uh, beautiful moldings, et cetera, very traditional uh, work that harkened back to the Beaux-Arts uh, and the Belle Epoque of, of a generation earlier. Here you see a wonderful, and, and, and artisans, by the way, uh, catered to this aesthetic. Uh, one of the greatest was Samuel Yellen in Philadelphia, and here you see a fire screen made for his own home uh, in the early 20s. And then in Cleveland, uh, because this is one of, the, one of the discoveries I wanted to uh, bring to your to your attention and peel back the the layers a bit with you is the Rose Ironworks. Uh, so Yellen was working in Philadelphia, Rose in in uh, Cleveland. There were others in New Orleans, Atlanta, uh, all around the country. Really, almost every a major town, major city had a foundry that catered to this kind of architectural, traditional architectural. Um, uh, uh, metalwork. Um, this, the Rose Ironworks, is a is still uh, a going concern in Cleveland, run now by um, this gentleman, Robert Rose, Bob Rose, who is the third generation of his family to run the Rose Ironworks. Uh, it's a hand forged uh, foundry and began with his grandfather Martin Rose, who was from um, Hungary. Uh, born in 1870 and emigrated to this country right around the turn of the century, around 1897, settled in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, um, where a large population of Hungarian immigrants had uh, developed. 
Martin Rose worked in, in several metalworking shops in Cleveland at the time. It was a thriving business there. Uh, and then finally uh, established his own foundry um, in 1904. And so he catered from 1904 to the, to the mid-1920s. He really catered to this traditional uh, aesthetic and architecture in Cleveland. Inside this little foundry, which is still there, and the, the original building is still there, he converted his house into the front office. And uh, all along the walls include uh, examples that he could show to his clients of this little rose or this kind of turning, uh, this uh, lock or this key that he could make, uh, examples of fence work and, and spindles and this, etc. Uh, he didn't have a, a, a catalog of sorts. It was all on the wall. And so throughout this building, you can see every flat surface of the walls are covered in uh, whatever size and uh, sort of metalwork turning you, you might require in your work, uh, in, in, in your house. He catered primarily to architects in Cleveland. He also collected uh, on travels back to Europe, um, and uh, had, he had collected along the way as well uh, examples of antique metalwork. And so within the vault are these great panels of antique metalwork that all could be used as reference points for um, his designer and um, uh, uh, metal workers in the back of in the furnace. Here you just see some of these incredible examples uh, that he was able to amass. Samuel Yellen did the same thing. He had this marvelous collection of metalwork uh, from the the uh, from the 15th and 16th and 17th centuries um, when uh, Yellen passed away, his works went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and to their collection. Here, they, they still reside in the Rose Iron Works in Cleveland. So uh, this is the kind of work that uh, Rose was doing in the, the period from Louis XV revivals, as you can see in this panel, to um, uh, Renaissance revivals, etc. Then in 1925, like so many other Americans, he traveled to Europe to see uh, what was touted as uh, the, the most current evocation of the modern in uh, the Western world, which was the 1925 Paris Exposition. Uh, the uh, Exposition Internationale des Arts Décoratifs um, and Industrial Moderne. Sarah says this a lot better than I do, but uh, um, anyway, in, so he and his wife and um, one of his sons, Melvin, who was uh, by this point uh, working in the firm, uh, traveled and spent almost an entire year uh, in Paris and going back to Hungary and traveling into Vienna. Um, uh, Martin Rose, uh, the, the founder of Rose Ironworks, had studied in Vienna uh, when he was younger. And so they traveled back there and really absorbed uh, the modernist aesthetic. They also uh, admired the work of uh, European metal workers at the time. In particular, uh, they were enamored with the style of Paul Kish, a uh, Hungarian working in uh, Paris, um, really very much influenced by Viennese design. So it was a familiar aesthetic to uh, Martin Rose. And indeed, uh, there are a number of works, um, several lamps, one in th that's included in this ex this exhibition, the Jazz Age, the one on the right, um, that they acquired in Paris um, during this trip uh, and brought back with them as examples of the kind of, uh, of styling that they wanted to favor. And you can see here this kind of patterning, very much a Viennese aesthetic in the work of Paul Kish. Here's another example of um, French metalwork that they brought back. Well, um, a few years later, by in, in meeting and in, um, in, in, in meeting Paul Kish and and in, and getting to know his work, they also got to know his principal designer, Paul Fair. And in 1929, Martin Rose received a letter from Fair saying, "How would you like to have me come and work for you in Cleveland, Ohio?" Uh, he had he had gotten into a dispute with Paul Kish and decided he would love to have. Uh, a new life in America. And so, um, indeed, Martin Rose brought him to America, and he became the principal designer at the Rose Ironworks. 
Um, and in doing so, he transformed the, the uh, output of the company. Um, by this point, Martin really wanted to embrace the modern aesthetic and uh, was hoping his clients would too. Um, he wasn't so successful in getting his clients to embrace it um, in conservative Cleveland, but certainly the output of the firm uh, really took a, a complete change, and, a, and a sea, it, it was a sea change, really. And uh, so here you see what we've put on the cover of the book, uh, the great Muse with Violin screen, because Paul arrived right as the crash was occurring in 1929, and so their output shrank to almost zero. Uh, yet he had all of these, Martin Rose had all of these talented designers and, I mean, t talented workers working for him, and he didn't want to let them go. So, um, even though the shop was about five to six people uh, in the early years of the Depression, uh, they worked continually on various designs and th that were uh, monumental in scale, including this magnificent screen, which showed every type of wood of metalworking that that one could do. The other great work that they they uh, worked on was the um, magnificent console and mirror that you see in the show today, which, by the way, is its first. Uh, outing. Uh, these things have lived all their lives in the in the shop in the front room of the Rose Ironworks. The screen has be been a bit more famous than the console and mirror, and it's been in that it has been uh, on view at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston as well as now in Cleveland, in the Cleveland Museum of Art. But the, this wonderful console and mirror you're seeing for the first time as all of us as well, it's just incredible with um, uh, detailing in in uh, sandblasted into the, to the the glass, this combination of glass and metal was um, something that they favored quite heavily during this period. Um, but still, the the orders didn't really come, and so Martin Rose was desperate to keep his workers working. And uh, one project that they did was to decorate the the um, rafters of the foundry itself with this incredible frieze, a cutout frieze. Um, depicting the history of metalwork from the very beginnings uh, to the present. And it goes all around the foundry. I'm just going to show you a few of these pictures. And there, it's still there. As inspiration, but also, in a way, a sort of ode to those very, very difficult times. I particularly like this, this one with the the anvil. So everywhere you look in this wonderful shop, uh, one sees um, a passion for the, the, the craft as well as um, an understanding of design and from earliest to the present. In the vault is another real treasure. Uh, for any of you who are archivists, uh, it's just extraordinary. They've kept all their records intact, um, their accounts. One need only uh, uh, take a book down to see the, the full panoply and history of this company. Uh, there are drawings, there are photographs, and indeed what's most interesting, I think, to Sarah and I were the, the, the two safes full of period books uh, of designs from this, uh, from the, uh, spanning the entire 20th century, really. Um, and, and historical volumes as well. Um, and then their vast blueprints uh, that they used for their work. So the Rose Ironworks, for me, was one of the great discoveries of this. I mean, I knew about them, but really understanding their place in uh, the spirit of change that was America in the 1920s was uh, really one of the, the great joys of this show. So now I'd like to turn it over to... Um, Emily Orr, Dr. Emily Orr, uh, if you will, uh, to talk a little bit uh, about uh, her work and her discoveries in the art of the department store display. Emily? So as Sarah
Sarah mentioned, I've spent a lot of the past few years thinking about department stores at the turn of the 20th century. And I think one of the major um, storylines throughout the exhibition and the catalog is the importance of the department store in the 1920s and 30s as well as this purveyor of modern taste. And um, what I'll spend the next few minutes telling you a little bit about is the importance of the window display as an advertising surface and the professionalization of um, this space in the modern urban city. So when American visitors attended the 1925 Paris Fair, their attention may have been caught not only by the products on view, but also by the context in which they were exhibited. Indoors and outdoors, a retail-like atmosphere pervaded the fair. Department store pavilions filled the grounds, merchandise arrangements appeared like showrooms, and a series of 21 modern shop fronts built along a major thoroughfare exhibited window displays as design objects unto themselves. Photographs of those storefronts were assembled in the volume whose cover you see on the screen here. The French architect and designer René Herbst completed the graphic design for its cover, as well as compiled the contents. This was one of a number of folios of inventive European retail designs that inspired Americans, including Gilbert Rohde, who purchased this book while in Paris in 1925. His name you'll see inscribed on the upper right corner of this cover. Three shops along the avenue were devoted to manufacturers of mannequins. Pierre Iman showed one window display and Siegel occupied two. Herbst himself served as artistic director of Siegel, and he introduced a new stylized format for the mannequin that had a head and body that soon crossed the ocean and was seen on magazine pages in new angles and in show windows of America's most fashion-forward shops. Herbst was one of a number of prominent architects and designers who became involved with the retail sphere, influencing design in both America and abroad. Stylish retail display, along with the product's form, materials, and packaging, increasingly became the responsibility of individual designers. The show window and the retail interior emerged as additional surfaces for the industrial designer to manipulate and make saleable and attractive for their clients' products. Norman Belgettis, who worked for a time as a theater stage designer specializing in lighting, pronounced the store as a stage on which merchandise is presented as the actors. One of his first forays into industrial design came in 1927 when he approached the Franklin Simon department store in New York. Disgusted with the cluttered appearance of many retail storefronts, Bel Geddes aimed to pare down the products and offer a new and different format. For instance, this 1929 window display featured an array of delicate pairs of shoes and various accessories propped on stepped blocks of a regular shape that radiated out from a wedge-shaped sign announcing new spring shoes. Valgetti's use of these blocks, in addition to a mannequin with an angular face, lent an abstract composition to the whole display. The shapes of these elements and the shoes themselves rather than any superfluous decoration, made the window visually compelling as well as saleable. Leading department stores benefited from this engagement of established designers and served as a career springboard for many others. Norman Belgettis, John Vassos, Donald Desky, Joseph Urban, Edgar Brandt, Frederick Kiesler, and Raymond Lowy, just for example, all became involved with department store design ranging from window displays and architectural elements to advertisements and shop fittings. In the early 20th century, the department store was revered as a discerning promoter of fashionability. An association with these retail empires guaranteed visibility and notoriety in a field that was just beginning, giving, beginning to give credit to its designers. As an impressionable and malleable category and space of advertising, the show window offered the designer great possibilities for creative experimentation and thinking. Like the department store itself, the hybrid nature of the show window was key to its attraction. 
The commercial arts were forging ahead in the 1920s, and window dressers gained notions of layout and language from advertising, a sense of focus from commercial photography, and an emphasis on lighting and color from theater design. In a 1930s article in Fortune magazine, Macy's artistic director described the window display as a combination of a poster, a newspaper, newspaper advertisement, a stage set, a speech, and a scarf dance. <laughs> Major department stores thus charted new territory for the window displays as exhibition space. American industrial designer Donald Dusky's windows for Franklin Simon frequently featured folding screens as backdrops, a prop often used in his interior designs for domestic interiors. Therefore, Dusky embraced the window display as marketing strategy for not only the store's wares, but his own design philosophy. This overlap in Dusky's practice suggests that the designer was applying his perspective on interior design to other contexts. In the store window, the screen served as an element of set design, while also encouraging consumers to think about its application in their own homes. In this design shown here, he created a collage of bold shapes and bright colors, accented with the use of metallics, such as galvanized iron, copper, and brass. For this window, Dusky also recommended a floor made of cork, an inexpensive yet durable material that was popular for adding textural contrast in the modern domestic interior. On the right-hand margin of the drawing, Dusky also gives an alternate background suggestion that shows a cogwheel and an outline that appear like the body of an appliance evocative of the machine age. The success of Dusky's windows for Franklin Simon brought him a commission in 1926 from Saks Fifth Avenue to decorate their show windows and contribute to their graphic identity. One advertising brochure covers shows an abstracted cubist composition reminiscent of a series of show windows themselves. Frederick Kiesler, an Austrian theoretician and architect with a background in set design, found his first significant commissions primarily in the medium of retail display. In 1928, he created what he proclaimed to be America's first representative exposition of modern show windows for Saks Fifth Avenue. Kiesler spoke of his spotlighted windows, accent one chair, one white fur, one sees only a chair and a white fur collar. The sense of simplicity allowed the consumer to focus on the goods. These windows stood in stark contrast to the busier windows of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. This move towards the unit principle, as it was called by industry experts, linked retail's display's emphasis on shape and line even more closely to recent developments in modern painting, sculpture, and architecture. Formal principles of abstraction, simplicity, and asymmetry were used to dramatic effect in these windows. His display furniture was based on pure geometries and basic industrial materials. In 1928, Kiesler began assembling research materials for a book on retail window display design. It was fully released in 1930 under the title, Contemporary Art Applied to the Store and Its Display. The result was an idiosyncratic volume that both offered practical advice to the retail manager, while also providing a survey of Kiesler's insights on modern art and architecture, introducing American audiences to a wide range of avant-garde European design. Kiesler also presented futuristic applications of technology in window displays, in which push-button systems gave access to merchandise, and screens and robots provided customer service. On a page illustrating Picasso's The Guitarist, Kiesler included Quote, a scheme for a display fixture developed with characteristic horizontal, vertical, and slightly curved planes. A geometric sketchy composition that related to the abstraction of the painting. Though Kiesler's device was likely never fabricated, the motivations behind his design were very much in line with the department store's concentration on the creation of a shared language between contemporary visual culture and trade not only in advertising, but also in the shopping environment. Lastly, it is important to note that in addition to its visual advantages, modern display was also promoted in the sound creation of an economically prosperous shopping environment. 
In, the 1920, in 1920, the authoritative American retail trade journal, The Merchant's Record and Show Window, reported, frequently do merchants estimate window sales or sales influenced by displays and show windows at better than 60% as many merchants have no hesitancy in crediting 75 or 80% of total business to the influence of goods displays. With show window and sale floor interiors transformed by guest collaborations from the worlds of art and design, and with the use of new technologies and tools that advance the medium sophistication, display played a pivotal role in the creative and financial success of the retail sphere in the 1920s and early 30s. So now I'll pass it over to Sarah to finish up. Thank you so much, Emily and Stephen. And this has been uh, wonderful to, um, to hear some of these thoughts uh, put together in this context, too, for those of us who've been working uh, on our own sort of focus and now to uh, be able to share them together. I had been working uh, very much on the idea of what was American in both what and how was American getting these new the idea for, ideas for new taste and realized that came through the importation of objects, the immigration of people, and obviously uh, <clears throat> the combination thereof, as well as homegrown talent and. Some of the, I think, some of the discoveries for me were how unbelievably integrated at a new level. Um, first of all, both Americans were in terms of studying abroad uh, uh, and in the artistic sphere and transferring from artistic, the artistic sphere to the design sphere, I mean, an artist sphere, I should say. So Emily's point about how these trend, this, uh, this organization came about in the department store display is very typical of how it crosses uh, borders. I wanted to start with uh, another aspect of the importation, and that is the role museums played, a uh, very strong role museums played. And while I won't say that I personally made this discovery, I think that uh, I began to realize that it was a much more significant part of the changing tastes in American design uh, than I had certainly realized. Uh, this chandelier, uh, which was was in the Wiener Werkstätte shop in New York, which lived briefly from 1920, June 1922 to the end of 1923, uh, designed by Dagobert Pecha, who was the design director of the Wiener Werkstatt at that point. Um, it was sold directly from the shop to the Metropolitan Museum. The Metropolitan had a fund set up by, by Edward C. Moore Jr., who was the, both the son of the president of Tiffany's and himself was a uh, principal of Tiffany's, and he felt it very important that the museum should not only make its collection available to designers and pr uh, product uh, creators uh, for study of objects from the past, but that they also become an example for the present. Uh, so here it is, electrified from the beginning, um, uh, shown as something that uh, American Museum had. They also acquired, uh, we also have in the exhibition pieces by Ruhlman that were acquired uh, and served as models just as the traditional pieces uh, did for firms like the Company of Master Craftsmen founded by uh, W. and J. Sloan. Uh, uh, doing uh, Ruhlman-esque pieces. Uh, Samuel Yellen, as Stephen mentioned, was a major exhibitor in the product, uh, the uh, industrial arts uh, exhibitions, um, and he used uh, the Metropolitan Museum as obviously as well as gave to it. Another discovery that I didn't make initially, but uh, I think I've uh, expanded upon what uh, are these incredible doors, uh, which were... Uh, excuse me, commissioned by the Solomon Guggenheims uh, in 1926 as a result of going to the Paris World's Fair in 25 and uh, with their uh, British decorator um, who 
advised them that he thought that Dunant and Sudbinin, Seraphim Sudbinim and Jean Dunant, who was Jean Dunant was the great uh, lacquer uh, specialist who'd studied with Japanese lacquerists, and he in fact was one of the major creators of screen design, and this was a major part of 1920s design. I think perhaps because of the change in architecture of the 20s that opened up free spaces, and this allowed you to divide rooms in different ways. In any case, a suite of doors and screens were made for them for what was their uh, music room. And what is interesting is here is the music room, and it is completely full of Louis this and Louis that. Um, and then you can see on this, just in the background, the screens, which are now at the Metropolitan Museum. And we were, they were given by Mrs. Guggenheim, after Mr. Guggenheim died, they were given um, the screens, and Cooper Hewitt was given this pair of doors. And uh, there are the screens up there, obviously rather smaller, but um, you get the ensemble effect. And what I became to realize, which I felt was sort of the tipping moment for me, was I thought, wait a minute, 26. They, Sudbinin and Dunant were very aware of the American patronage potentially from the fair and sent them over and arranged for a gallery to exhibit these before they were sent to the Guggenheims. And so they were exhibited in a gallery in 1926 and then went out to Port Washington. And uh, this was important because, to me because it meant that the Guggenheims were collecting something that was bordering on modern art before they actually collected their first painting that became, went into what became the Guggenheim Museum. And that did not happen until 1927. So this is a case of where the decorative arts introduced a collector towards moving into uh, the new realms artistically. Another uh, find uh, that was not completely a find, but uh, in the Richard Driehaus co private collection in Chicago were four panels that were discovered about seven years ago that had survived uh, the destruction of the Ziegfeld Theater in New York. And what was, what was terrific was that not only does this give us a, a sense of Joseph Urban, who created them with Lillian Gertner painting them, uh, but it, it shows this sense of fantasy and, in fact, that uh, Urban came to this country as an opera uh, set designer and then went in not only as an architect but also as a stage, uh, not only as a stage designer but as a film designer and everything else that related to both architecture, the world of film and the world of theater. And this was, is important because, in fact, it directly relates to the uh, fantasy designs that occurred in in uh, Vienna again at the time. And I think that ultimately the importance of Vienna as an art, artistic and design center that really, as Stephen correctly said, that it's before World War I. In fact, this dates really back to the turn of the 20th century. All the So many people who came to this country trained in Vienna. Uh, they were products of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and they came out for economic reasons. They found it, but that they really were mixed and worked with both American designers and uh, in various combinations in groups to uh, produce uh, a new aesthetic. But here we have a picture of the uh, interior of the Ziegfeld Theater that is up, uh, the urban uh, archives are up at Columbia University, and this is part of it showing um, the decoration. And in fact, they also have up at Columbia the model of that Urban did to show what it was he was intending. And uh, likewise, he did a similar design for the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in 1927, and then it turned out a, a fellow Austro-Hungarian uh, <coughs> emigre uh, uh, was sent out, of having got, been at the Waldorfs, went out to be manager and, uh, of the Hotel Gibson in Cincinnati and invited Urban, whom he'd known in Vienna, to, to design for that. So Urban created a very similar fantasy, fantasy design um, for this hotel, and this drawing is in uh, Cooper Hewitt, another treasure from our collection uh, that has enabled us to uh, understand the breadth of uh, Urban's influence. Urban also uh, designed the first 
movie with a modern interior called Enchantment. It featured Marion Davies, the actress, who was um, promoted by Hearst, and in fact, it was for Hearst's uh, movie company. Um, and after the success of Enchantment, which is about a y very modern young woman whose um, mother is very disapproving about her going out with all these men and putting on bright lipstick, and you can see a snippet of it up in the exhibition. But more importantly, it features furniture and furnishings by Urban and others of his friends. Um, here we have uh, what I think is key to understanding American style that has nothing really to do with the 1925 fair, but is absolutely central. Uh, Hugh Ferris, uh, these, this is one of four drawings in our collection of studies for the maximum mass permitted by the 1916 setback law. This was the law that said in order to get enough light down to the street, you, uh, the, uh, that the upper floor should be set back. And he produced these very very dramatic drawings in 1922 and published all four of them, which are in our collection, in the New York Times Magazine. This seems to have had huge circulation and was very influential on um, both in attracting uh, um, architects to this country who were uh, had become to look at sk as skyscrapers as a, a very major reason for uh, cultural tourism. Uh, key to the period is Paul Frankel, one of the most important figures. Again, Austrian born and trained. He came here just uh, prior to World War I. He set up a gallery. He, for a long time, tried to sell modern design objects to Americans, not terribly successfully, both of his own and others' uh, uh, others creation. But he's the one person who did not go to Paris in 1925. He stayed here. He worked up in Woodstock, Vermont, stacking boxes and other uh, and woodwork to create the first skyscraper form piece of furniture. And this is not the first of his examples, but it is an extraordinary piece that uh, Stephen found in the Grand Rapids Art Museum, so not one that very many people have had the pleasure of seeing before, and it has a complete sort of in-the-round architectural desk, and then these wonderful skyline skyscrapers of bookcases uh, growing up on three sides. Uh, so this this presented a really an, an original creation, but it came out of feeling at home. He'd now been in the country for, um, and he started making the skyscraper furniture in 25-26, just at the, towards the end of the, um, after the Paris Fair was over. And uh, this is a new expression, and it's coming from this country, from its architecture, and the other great architectural influence having been Frank Lloyd Wright, who influenced Europeans. But you see the beginning of abstraction in furniture, which, of course, also relates to Cubism. And you see it in the work of Donald Desky, who actually did go to Paris and studied for a couple of years, studied painting in Paris. He also made some screens in Paris, but he went back for the Paris 25 fair. But after he got back and he was doing the Saks Fifth Avenue windows, um, the head of Saks Fifth Avenue, uh, Gimbel, uh, introduced him to Paul Frankel and Frankel invited him to display some of his screens um, in his gallery. And I like to think that I've been sort of tracking the pieces by Frankel that are known date and it does seem that he had wor started working with this woodwork the actual wood grains and so forth, uh, simple woods usually to begin with. But some of the Frankel pieces evolve into having lacquer, which you will see, and shiny surfaces. And I actually think that's likely to be the impact of his interaction with Donald Desky, a Minnesota-born, raised, in other words, an, a completely American designer, and they're interacting together in the selling of, furni of furniture in Frankel's gallery. And then, and, and then Desky had also visited the Bauhaus when he was in Europe in 25, and he also then started working on chromed furniture, which is part of uh, another story where he worked with American manufacturers 
uh, this wastebasket by Frankel even includes a skyscraper motif, a wonderful object that came to light from one of our uh, patrons here. So um, uh, we are very glad to see these things in conversation with each other, much as they might have been in the galleries. This chair uh, was... Um, out of uh, unknown until it surfaced at auction a couple of years ago and through a friend and colleague um, I tracked down the owner and who uh, chooses to remain completely anonymous but it was in the Macy's 1928 art and industry exhibition and here we do have an original image of where how it looked on display but again incredible use of the skyscraper motif by Walter von Nessen, a German-born architect who was mainly known for his lighting. But it does show that the these unusual efforts that were combining perhaps a bit of a Biedermeier uh, form of chair um, in a new material and a new look uh, for a new country. Another uh, penny that dropped while working on this rather late in the day, in fact, was that um, the, this wonderful coverlet uh, made of a textile called Electric by Ruth Reeves, uh, uh, in fact, fetid electricity uh, with this completely abstract design. Ruth Reeves had gone to Paris and was there for, uh, uh, I think, seven years um, in, the, tw in uh, the 20s. And when she got back, she had a number of designs in mind and created fabrics ranging from designs of Manhattan skyscrapers to abstract designs. She had studied with Leger, but clearly picked up the influence of other Parisian artists and transferred them to the, t the world of textiles. So you have all these different media talking to each other. And this one was actually, although made originally uh, two-sided, to be used for uh, curtains and upholstery for a radio room, uh, new, the original media room, perhaps. The, you remember the first broadcast of the radio is 1920. Uh, this, in fact, was printed on a, a loose-weave cotton and used as a coverlet and was a quite... The, the coverlet was for a couple, uh, Glendon and Louise uh, Alvine, who built... Uh, built this house, had this house built uh, out in um, Long Island, uh, and was one of the first. Um, oh, that's interesting. We have the. Uh, I've got the 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 the, uh, the uh, um, uh, text reversed. Apologies, but in any case, the um, the Alvine house uh, dated from 29 to 51, and it was by a man who specialized in sort of Tudor mansions. So this was a new assignment, but Alvine himself had been to Paris, seen the works of Mar Mallet Stevens uh, and others, and he was a film, pro uh, out, uh, done did publicity for Fox Films, so he was out on the West Coast and had seen the work of Schindler and Neutra and so on. So he wanted to be the one, and he really did build the first modernist house in it, complete with by being on the shore decks on all sides, as well as on one side having portals, porthole windows. So very definitely referencing the sea in a modernist way. But the mate to this screen, which the one we have here in the exhibition, a promise gift from George Kravis, um, is in the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And it goes down like the other way, as if you might have had two, one for each corner. And the mate was also owned by the Glendon Alvines. So suddenly I realized that here we've got, in conversation with each other in the exhibition, two pieces that were acquired at the same moment by the same collectors who were also the first among the first to do have the architecture to go with it. And I think it's interesting because we do find this push towards modernism so also so collected connected to the film world. And then just briefly to show you a couple of other things, uh, Emily has discussed the department store, but Therese Bonnet, a very great documenter of uh, what's happening in the latest and greatest in Paris, uh, we found this photograph in our Therese Bonnet archive at the library showing the um, probable model by Léon Jalot, all covered in chagrin, of shark skin, very elaborate and expensive material. And Marie-Louise Montgomery, uh, who um, went and bought this um, vanity from Lord and Taylor, had Lord and Taylor's modern shop make it for her, obviously had either seen or seen uh, a photograph of 
uh, Leon Jalot's work, and she was going to have one at a more modest rate for as when she got married for her newly modern home. And that's another point. The um, young at heart, uh, you sometimes see the silver plated pieces selling better than the silver because it was the young at heart, if not young in in age, who were buying uh, these things. But it was also about American desire to mass produce. And we find this tension between European handcrafting and Americans' desire for spreading mass product through mass production uh, designs uh, in play in the 20s. It turned out to be a very good thing that we'd figured out how to mass produce things when the crash came. Another Another point just here, we have Joseph Urban. This is the side chair from his office. It's on our collection, and um, uh, it, it, there it is showing up in his office. Well, Urban hired Paul Frankel to do a suite of rooms up upstairs at Mar-a-Lago. And here you can see Mar-a-Lago. Um, it was Marjorie Merriweather Post when she was Mrs. E.F. Hutton who uh, commissioned uh, Urban to do a lot of the interior de design and the exterior decoration. There were tiled walls and, and Gothic and Moorish sort of arches. But in the back, as they said, yeah, upstairs, there were this suite of rooms. And here is an example of, of Frankel's lacquered, uh, sort of this yellow, shiny surface, very much influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright, the strong horizontals, the original blotter and chair. Uh, seat cover by Paul Rodier, a French designer whom Frankel carried in his in his shop. So this all made sense. Uh, and what what the reason Yale now has this suite is because when uh, Mr. Trump bought Mar a Lago, he seemed to love all the Louis this and Louis that, but he didn't love the uh, modern pieces by Frankel, and they went out to a collector dealer. Uh, in Florida and ultimately surfaced at Christie's. Uh, one other discovery that we've just made was that when we started, uh, Stephen and I uh, were thought this carpet was a great example of showing the impact of the Dutch de style movement. Uh, it's from the Art Institute of Chicago and very much reflects the aesthetic uh, like the Frankel desk. Uh, we knew that we had, from one photograph in our, 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 our existing digitized images, this image of a, of a carpet design by Marion Dorn, who married Edward McKnight Taufer. And so we thought we'd like to show that. However, uh, we then suggested that, in fact, the Drawings and Prints Department might prioritize the rest once we found out it was in a book. And the next thing I knew, uh, the other day, we were actually looking at the the new images and <laughs> finally got them. And lo and behold, we have the design for the Art Institute of Chicago sitting in a book right here. Um, so that was very exciting. A discovery we didn't make, but the uh, Rhode Island School of Design in the process of preparing to send their wonderful coffee set, The Lights and Shadows of uh, Manhattan by Eric Magnuson, a Danish um, a designer who worked for Gorham in this case. This is a good example of silver and silver gilt that never sold, um, but and so remained in Gorham's collection till they gave it to the RISD Museum. But they found this picture, this this drawing of the period, and it clearly was much shinier with black and gold um, uh, uh, angles that straight out of a cub cubist design, and they re they cleaned off what turned out to be, I guess, yellowed uh, varnish or something, and re cleaned and found they indeed did have black, gold, and silver. So this is the first time anybody will have seen this extraordinary set that um, was featured as if it was a, a set of skyscrapers. And then we'll just end up with a few fun items. Uh, another product of doing the show and having the press was that bow brooch was in the New York Times article. And the next and two days ago, I got a call from a man who said, I'm the great grandson of the woman who owned this brooch. And if you can tell me if there's a little crack in the onyx and a little, and I said, yes, there is actually. And he said, that's the one. Anyway, and so, <laughs> so um, at um, any rate, this was fun because we found out that this um, Baroness von Bernstorff, this is her a little bit later, she, um, uh, who married uh, umpteen times, was apparently totally a family scandal. So until she sort of um, took 
an interest in him that she lived to 104, so he remembers her quite well. But she had she uh, she also had been married to two Germans. The second one of which she was meant she was living in Germany through World War One, which didn't make her too popular with her American family. But then she then she married an even richer uh, Englishman and acquired a f great amount of jewelry uh, for, with him. So and and he said that he remembered her wearing this bow with sweaters as a sort of day to day brooch. It's enormous. <laughs> It's enormous. <laughs> uh, another, I hope, discovery, I think I contacted the curator at, at um, Newark, but I've been suggesting that this bracelet, uh, this top bracelet uh, that was retailed by um, the... Um, this one is by Heyman, and the one down below is retailed by J.E. Colwell, is in the Newark Museum, and I'm quite sure that it is by Oscar Heyman, and, um, and he said he, uh, that certainly that he, based on what I was able to show him, uh, felt that that was undoubtedly the case, but it gave us another clue into the retail practices of certain firms that did d jewelry not to sell directly so much as to sell through the shops. And just to end on a couple of very funny notes, this bracelet that's in the exhibition, a good 1920s fabulous French bracelet, was owned by um, Mae West, and this it is actually this bracelet on her arm. She she later developed, uh, she went, did, had an, did an act with, a, got involved with bodybuilders in Las Vegas, and, and her de dearly beloved bodybuilder, builder Charles Krause, was, who was 30 years her junior, and st apparently stayed with her for the rest of his life, and she left him his jewelry. And uh, her jewelry, and he never sold it during his life. And when he died, they opened up the safety de deposit box. And uh, Neil Lane, who owns this, bought it directly from his estate sale. So it actually was a long, ongoing and long-term relationship. And then I thought, just to end, you had to see that. <laughs> This, although she didn't own it in the 20s, she probably, Zsa, Zsa Gabor probably acquired this when she was married to, to Conrad Hilton, and it may have been his mother's, but she had an extender made so she could wear the bracelet as a necklace and was seen throughout her life. Uh, she owned it at, at least until the, around 2000. Uh, uh, throughout her life, uh, wearing it in various uh, at various ages, and I think if you uh, Google her, uh, that you will probably see multiple images uh, with her with this bracelet on. So I bring these in uh, at both for fun, but also to remind you that all these objects have had a life a lot after the 1920s, and we're lucky enough, having done this, uh, created this exhibition now to still have enough people alive who remember people who, even if we aren't talking with people who were adults in the 20s, we are talking with people who remember people well and room settings that were and lifestyles that were created in the 20, 20s. And so with that, I'm going to turn to ask my colleagues, I will um, turn up the lights, and um, I'm going to pose each of them a question, and then we'll open it up to all of you for questions. So thank you. <laughs> So the question I have, because I was I thinking a lot about it, is what were the big, were, what were our big surprises? And so I'll start with Stephen. Did you find something that particularly surprised you in doing the exhibition? Well, yes. I never really understood the motivation of a jewelry thief until <laughs> I handled some of these amazing jewels in the show. <laughs> that was one thing. <laughs> Oh, you mean you mean an object? <laughs> oh, no, right. I, I um, mean any kind of surprise. <laughs> well, no, that was one of them, and I I have to say, you know, coming across um, objects like the the great Frankel bookcase, and just knowing that uh, in this exhibition it would be the first time that that uh, the wider audience will have seen something like this, uh, that's really what uh, 
makes being a curator so fun, you know, in putting together uh, shows like this. I think, though, for me, really, the one uh, great discovery um, was the, is the portrait of Hattie Carnegie by Jean Dunant that you'll see in the exhibition upstairs. Um, this portrait uh, actually descended in the family of Hattie Carnegie to uh, one of her, her great nieces in Cleveland, Ohio. And um, if, if, as happens, uh, and I can say this because it wasn't me, but one of my colleagues in paintings, um, an object like that, which is part painting, part decorative arts, sometimes falls through the cracks. So when um, this lady was dispersing her work, uh, I mean, her, her objects, she called in the Cleveland Museum of Art and we took all manner of other things, but uh, did not decide to take that beautiful painting. Oh my um, it was in a terrible 1950s frame and uh, it was sold to a local antiques dealer. And I was bopping around the pier show one day uh, in a t couple of years ago, and this antiques dealer had decided to exhibit at the pier show just here in New York. And lo and behold, there was Hattie Carnegie on the wall. Um, so he, he graciously uh, put it on hold, took it off, you know, took it off you, and uh, agreed to, to lend it to the exhibition. So has kept it in, in uh, you know, his private uh, uh, stash since then. And we've given it a new frame. But the wonderful thing about Hattie Carnegie is that she's one of those great 1920s stories where she came off the boat as an immigrant with a different name and saw Andrew Carnegie on the headlines <laughs> of the newspaper, the New York Times, and took his name. Uh, she then, uh, one of her first jobs was running uh, peace goods back and forth in the Lower East Side uh, between makers and, and sellers. And then she uh, got a job at um, Saks Fifth Avenue and she continued to expand her horizons such that she would um, go back and forth to Europe and bring back uh, uh, small amounts of, of clothing, dresses, and then sell almost like a trunk show to, to ladies that she'd met over the counter at Saks Fifth Avenue. This developed into a business, uh, and she then became one of the most successful boutique owners in, um, in the time, uh, the first woman to have a shop on Fifth Avenue of her own, uh, the first millionaire of her ilk, and so it must have been in those in those in the twenties that she, going back and forth, she must have known the set uh, of of glitterati in Paris that included Jean Dunant, and she, like so many others uh, of that uh, ilk, had her portrait taken. Now I want you to notice when you look at it again that she's not smiling; she's looking over her shoulder at you with glaring eyes almost daring you to take away the success that she's achieved. And I, I love the fact that, uh, you know, she's filled with the sort of diffidence and, and um, power that, that, that came with finally achieving the ultimate success. So hats off to Hattie Carnegie. And by the way, rumor has it that uh, she, she was the woman who employed Lucille Ball, who had come to New York, uh, to be on the stage and needed a job. And so she employed her as a walker of fashion in her shop. And rumor has it that she, in, in, before uh, modeling a red dress, she, uh, Hattie Carnegie told her to dye her hair red. And that was the end of the story, of course. <laughs> so anyway, uh, notice Hattie Carnegie and uh, think of all that she achieved. And uh, that's my probably my greatest surprise of the show. Emily. <laughs> well, one of the things that I find most fascinating about this period is how designers so freely work across media and at different price points. So they're working from high to low. They're doing very high style private commissions at the same time. They're being hired by major manufacturers to do um, restyle products that are being made at the serial and mass production level. And I think as you walk through the show, there are names that come up again and again. It's this cast of characters, but sometimes they come up in unexpected ways. And I think one of the most dramatic examples in the show as you walk around is you'll see on the second 
second floor, a glorious screen by Ratto in gold and black with a s landscape scene of glamorous foxes that was made as a private um, commission for um, Jean Lanvin in Paris, the designer. Um, but then you'll see also on the third floor um, two more objects by Rateau, one that you might guess knowing the previous commission, but one that you might not if you're paying close attention <laughs> to the labels. Um, the first is a perfume bottle that Rateau went on to design for Lanvin, a gilded, um, beautiful perfume bottle that stands next to um, the well-known Lanvin logo, um, a kind of sculpture and perfume bottle pair. But in a nearby case, you'll also see a small box um, for a Minneapolis department store. So um, the Quinlan department store in Minneapolis hired Rateau um, in the late 1920s. They had rebuilt their store as this grand modernist structure. And um, so the story goes that one of the owners went to Paris seeking a designer to redo their graphic identity. And um, this woman sought out Rateau, and at the time he did all of the graphic design um, for the store in addition to their package design. So you'll see this small little black box with a figure of an elegant, um, female on the cover with a string of pearls lounging on a, on a sofa. So that's a great story of high and low, and um, you really see this throughout the show. I think that's a very good point, and it also leads to perhaps another aspect that I, I noticed that surprised me a little bit, but um, perhaps not as much as if I hadn't done uh, the Van Cleef and Arpels exhibition, but the fact of the, un the it wasn't just about the women getting the right to vote and feeling greater independence uh, socially, but or that the idea of seduction and makeup and drinking and smoking and doing all kinds of things that women didn't do before that, or at least not in, in reasonable uh, company, but the extraordinary role of the woman as with purchase power. And the number of times when I did archival work where the women, a woman was listed as the purchaser of the jewelry. The woman was spending a lot of money on her fashion. Uh, it was, and also that it was Hattie Carnegie, at Carnegie and um, uh, Coco Chanel, I mean, you're talking about women designers uh, actually designing. You also have the profession of interior designer becoming a profession with many women uh, involved. Obviously, Nancy McClellan is represented with her importation of wallpapers, but it turns out to be significant. We have Ruth Reeves, uh, what, no, one day, this uh, uh, collector came in and he heard we were working on this and it was very recently, too recently to add to the show, but he suddenly brought in a Ruth Reeves textile and some other pictures and I realized with, from what he was saying that Marion Dorn, the one who married uh, Edward McKnight Cowfer, had previously been married to Henry Varnum Poor, which he showed us a portrait of the two of them and their total opposites, and you would never have thought about it, but that the two of them, plus Ruth Reeves, pl with whom I guess she first went to Paris and then later and met her, American husband over there, and then, uh, uh, or the next American husband, and then she, and then um, uh, they and Ilonka Karaz and Donald Desky all were part of the AUDAC, the American Union of um, Designers and so forth, that were very much based on a similar Paris group, but these names of these groups always include a fair number of women designers who are making a very strong impact in the design world. And I think that we all tend to think about the professionalization of women as being somewhat later. And it really, you know, we have a lot of women uh, designers, uh, purchasers, uh, I mean, and when I mean it, I, that it's not just their hubby's given it to them. They're actually out buying and commissioning this jewelry and these outfits. So uh, that was a surprise. I hadn't realized it would be that strong, and it was. So may we open it up to questions from the floor? Do wait for the, um, do wait for the microphone so that it can get into the system, so to speak. So qu uh, anybody want to continue this conversation or have comments or questions about uh, the aims? So. 
I just, I don't have a question, but I do have a Hattie Carnegie story of sorts of. Please. Uh, when I was much younger, back in the late Stone Age, uh, girls in school were still required to take courses in sewing and cooking and even had a millinery course at one point. And I don't, it's so long ago, I don't remember whether it was for sixth grade graduation or ninth grade graduation, we had to make our own dress. We got the pattern, we had follow the same pattern, we could pick our own colors and whatever. But when it came to the final, the dress had to be machine sewn. Now, we didn't have a machine. And the teachers being totally unreasonable and thought that it had to be machine sewn, you must know somebody with a sewing machine. Well, the only one I knew with a sewing machine was the aunt of my older sister's best friend <laughs> who lived with the family. And this woman was a seamstress for Hattie Carnegie. Oh. And I asked if I could sew my dress on her machine, and she said, absolutely not, but I will sew it for you. So I had a graduation dress sewn by a Hattie Carnegie seamstress, and I was very proud of this at the time. Well, as, as one of the curators of this exhibition, I deem it a Hattie Carnegie. How about that? Thank you. That's right. I wish I still had it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Laurie, yes, hold on a second, just so you can get it. Wait, 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 just, sorry, wait, we got it. But Hi. On. Before this period, um, were, there, were there many women who were dis clothing designers, fashion designers, jewelry designers? Was this really the period where women had this opportunity for the first time to do this sort of thing? I think on the whole, although maybe Emily and Stephen might want to also address that from their respective perspectives of having worked on department stores and jewelry of earlier date, but certainly in my experience we have the the great discoveries about the Tiffany studio and how that turned out to be the Tiffany girls meet over Beck and so on, that uh, he, Tiffany had, had women working for him who actually were responsible as designers, but in fact what the piece that's up uh, of Tiffany that's up there is in fact by Mita Overbeck and it is from the 20s but the style more reflects some of the things that the firm was doing earlier. You do also have Clara, uh, what is it, Wells in Chicago working with the Kayla workshops and that too is uh, outgrowing of the arts and crafts movement in 1905, 1910, 11 and they produce jewelry uh, but um, what do you think of it? Well, uh, well, certainly, yes, there were, were um, strong uh, uh, female um, influences in the decorative arts, uh, as Sarah says, around the turn of the century. The, I think of also the new compadre in, right. in New Orleans, which was a, a, a women's uh, college, um, making the most extraordinary pottery during the, that arts and crafts period. But I think really it was after World War I, that women really come out of the closet as the, the great unsung designers behind a lot of the, the designs that people uh, now recognize from that era. Um, probably uh, in the realm of jewelry that women had um, more to do with, with uh, the final iterations uh, yeah. of, of various commissions than we might think. But, as with Tiffany, you know, they were they were largely anonymous and unknown and unsung their role. Um, but it's in the 1920s that uh, you see the rise of the interior designer, the professionalism of industrial design, um, and women take their their place. It was definitely still a man's world, uh, but uh, they fight hard, and uh, that's why I want all of you to go look at that. Uh, gaze of Hattie Carnegie because she <laughs> she is definitely daring anyone to take away her success. Well, and to Stephen's point about interior design, actually, the department store is a great place to find early employment of women who, you know, m for the most part, started out um, behind the counter selling the wares, but into um, the teens certainly, and then by the twenties, start doing much of the displays and a lot of the women working in the display realm, such as Nancy McClellan, um, whose wallpapers we have in the exhibition, um, started out in interior design. You know, their first professional experiences were working on the department store sales floor. So it was really one of the first all-inclusive, I would say, um, employment opportunities for women in the early 20th century. And just to that point, uh, the other 
extremely important part about the role of the department store is, I hate to say it, but I'm old enough to remember when W&J Sloan was still around selling antiques as well as modern furniture, yep. and so was Lord & Taylor a major source still. So uh, on the other hand, it was perhaps not as cutting edge as it was in the 20s, but to that point, and a very important point, is that uh, Lord & Taylor and Macy's both had repeat uh, exhibitions, the most important of which and the most catalogued of which were in 1928. Of, uh, in the case of Lord and Taylor, early in 28, it was French decorative arts with a few other things. Macy's had a more mixed array and included American designers, Italian, uh, Austrian, German, uh, which uh, Lord and Taylor had followed the suit of the 25 fair and not in having any German design. Uh, in any case, these the, the designs that were picked out were by two women. Both Lord and Taylor's and Macy's had as the head of their design and the, the principal curator cum organizer, uh, Dorothy Schaefer, etc., would go to Europe, etc. They were both women in both department stores. In other words, they were the ones who made the design selection of what designers and what pieces were going to be included and how they were going to be displayed. And I think that is a very telling thing, even though you have the role of the um, museum director of Joseph Hoffman writing a section of Robert DeForest writing an introduction, which is another fact that you have the museums and the department stores in collaboration. The museums viewed it, or particularly the Met, as its uh, a strong need for it to play a role in the improvement in the uh, development of American taste for the modern and they therefore sanctioned these exhibitions they helped organize them and so Robert DeForest actually wrote the preface so uh, for these exhibitions who as president of the Metropolitan Museum but the people who organized it were the men were the women I have a question about um, what what part of the story do you think is a, a Jewish immigrant connection? Because Hattie Carnegie is certainly Jewish. I don't know if Rose is Jewish. I have a suspicion. Yes. Yes. Yet, and yes, then, definitely. of course, a lot of the department store owners that were very successful at that time were, were Jewish immigrants. And I'm wondering um, if, that, if, if a good percentage of the people that are the players, I guess, in this are Jewish. Yes, is the answer, certainly. But the... It's the reasons are varied, and there certainly are plenty, as in W. J. Sloan and uh, Lord and Taylor, and so on. There were plenty who were not, but the this core group who were involved in the avant-garde, bringing, helping bring it, with their training in Vienna, a lot of them had, in fact, the they had a lot of of of, of Jewish clients also in Vienna. And I, but it was a limited sphere in terms of the number of people that they could sell to. And I, it was, but it was very much about the economics, I think, of world, of the disasters of World War I and the rampant inflation afterwards, that there wasn't much of a market. So I don't think that their being Jewish or not Jewish played a role as much in why they came as the overall opportunities of patronage as it would. However, it so happens that I am sure that the fact that there were a number here and there was the New York in particular and also Los Angeles, which were such centers for the advancement of this taste, um, that there became a comfort level of people who were accepted and brought forward, but it is a, it's a very different reason from the mid-30s, which we stop before the next reason, I mean. And, um, and there, I'm sure there were political, personal persecution reasons at times if people felt uh, ostracized in their societies, but you don't have that sense that anybody left Vienna, I mean, that the group we're talking about primarily left Vienna because of some sense that they were not being patronized because of their religion or their ethnicity. It seems to be mostly economic, but there is a huge, huge impact of, in terms of the um, number of designers who, um, who certainly were 
uh, coming from those countries and perhaps for that reason. Do we have any more questions? Great, well thank you all so much for being here tonight. <laughs>